it's interesting when you when I started out on this idea of trying to pick out things that happened in Jesus last week and the the the, the overall title of this series of messages is the week that changed everything and that is literally what happened the world the universe would never be the same after this week and so it is right it's good that we celebrate not just Easter Sunday morning or not even Palm Sunday like we would we would normally do today but we dedicate in fact I don't think four weeks is enough I think next year we're gonna back it up maybe even a little more than that because when you're looking at at, at all of these things you you, you kind of wonder okay what do I leave out that's always kind of the kind of the big thing when you're talking about Jesus last week on this planet and especially after it ramps up after his arrest in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so one of the things I have always been so fascinated about with God's Word, and there's a lot of things, but one of the things I have been so fascinated with his Word has been Jesus' interaction with people when he was on this planet. See, we have to live vicariously through that, right? Because we, we didn't see Jesus in person. We didn't see his physical being. We didn't know the sound of his voice or... You know, as I've said before, the sound of his laugh or what he liked to eat or what he didn't like to eat and all the other things that kind of go along with just knowing another human being from a physical standpoint. We didn't have that, so we have to sort of live vicariously through the people we do. And you think about the long list of the people in the Gospels that Jesus had interaction with, the people that he, he, he came across and spoke to over the course of those three years or so that are recorded, the ones at least that we have co- recorded in the New Testament. I don't know about you, but names immediately start jumping into my head. You know, you have to, and even if it's not a name, it's a person we're all familiar with, right? The woman at the well, who we have no idea what her name was. Nicodemus, uh, Zacchaeus, the man at the pool at Bethesda, the woman caught in adultery, the woman who felt so sinful that she didn't even think it was worthy for her tears to end up on Jesus' face, that she cried on his feet and we used her hair to get the tears off of his feet because she felt so unworthy even her tears shouldn't have even touched him the the demoniac the guy who had the demons in him all of these the ten lepers and we can go a, a Jairus and his daughter on and on and on and on to see the interaction that Jesus had with these people during his lifetime and then I started thinking what about the people that Jesus had interaction with in his last hours on earth and so, I mean, I, I know I've read this stuff a lot and gone over it a lot. I was actually, frankly, surprised at how many different people Jesus interacted with in the very hours leading up to his crucifixion. I would have thought at this particular point he would have kind of put that on hold, right, and just kind of go through the process and, and, and go through the crucifixion and go through the resurrection. But no, from the time, from the moment that the soldiers entered the garden to arrest him, Jesus was interacting with a variety of people. And that's what we're going to do here today on this Sunday, right before we celebrate Easter. And we're going to look in those hours before Jesus was actually nailed to the cross, what kind of interaction did he have with people and what does it mean? Because it's not just enough to say, oh, that was kind of cool that he interacted with the person. Oh, that was kind of nice that he interacted with the person. There's always a reason for everything that Jesus did. There's always a reason why it ended up in Scripture in the first place. It's not just to give us information, even though that's part of it. It's not just because, yeah, because look, look, does, is Jesus going to be crucified? And is he going to resurrect, even if we had no account of any of these interactions with these people? The short answer to that question is, of course, yes. It doesn't really change what happens it's not from a strictly for strictly from a from a from a from a story standpoint it doesn't matter whether those events are recorded or not it gives us more clarity gives us more understanding i get that but jesus is still going to be crucified at the end of the day that's still going to be communicated to us he's still going to rise again that's going to be communicated to us so why in the world would the gospel writers add in these little bits of information related to Jesus having interaction with people in the very hours before the most horrific thing that could possibly happen to a human being was about to happen to him. So that's what we're going to look at today. And we're going to look at six people. Actually, that's not technically true. Five people and one group of people. We'll get to that when we get to the last one here. But there are going to be six people that we're going to look at that Jesus had personal interaction with before his crucifixion. And we need to ask the same question we need to ask about all of that stuff. Why is it in there? Why? Why do we need to know these stories? Why do we need this? Is like, this is not just for information. 
There's got to be a reason for it. And as I began to look at that, and I began to look at how he interacted with each one of them and how each of one of those interactions revealed a certain aspect to the reason he was born in the first place, it all began to start coming very clear to me. And I hope you're going to see that as well. These are amazing things. Remember, Jesus was, so, was filled with so much anxiety about what was going to happen to him when he was in the garden that he literally sweated blood. Hematidrosis is the scientific name, the medical name of that thing. It's very, very rare. Most of the information that we have related to that is actually based on one case, believe it or not. And it's, it's when extreme pressure or anxiety is placed on somebody and it causes the capillaries under the skin to burst and you actually have blood that mixes with your sweat. When you, and that's what happened with Jesus. And so in the midst of all of that, when something that horrible and horrific was about to happen to him, he still manufactured it. He orchestrated every single one of these meetings. None of them happened by accident because things don't happen by accident when God is exercising his will. And that's what I want us to see. We are leading to the fulfillment of a promise that was made in the Garden of Eden. This is what it's all been leading up to. Remember when God removed Adam and Eve from the Garden after they fell. Do you remember why he said he was removing Adam and Eve from the Garden after they sinned? Was it as a result, was it a consequence of their actions? Yes, there was a, consequence, was a consequence of their actions. But that's not why God said he was removing them from the Garden of Eden. Do you remember that? He didn't say that. He didn't say, I'm punishing you by kicking you out of here. He said, basically, I'm moving you out of the Garden to save you. Because if Adam and Eve had eaten from the Tree of Life, he said, God said, they would live like this forever. They would be beyond redemption. So at the very moment when Adam and Eve sinned and God ushered them out of the Garden of Eden, the plans for the crucifixion and resurrection were already well underway. How cool is that? At the very moment of the worst of humanity, the fall, the sin that we inherited from them, God was already planning our redemption. That, that's, just, it's, it's, that's almost too much for me to even fathom. And so as we get ready to celebrate this glorious event, and you'll hear me next week when we talk about it, I'll keep mentioning, I know it's Resurrection Sunday, but you'll hear me keep talking about the crucifixion and resurrection because those are two sides of the same coin. They're not two different events. You cannot have one without the other. We'll talk about that. We'll save that and talk about that next week. But what we're going to do here with a little bit of time that we have is I want us to look at these people that Jesus decided to talk to, or in one case, not talk to, and why. Why? Why would he orchestrate this? Why would he engage with these people in these moments? Well, hopefully we're going to be able to see this when it's all said and done. So we're going to be around in a variety of passages, but I do have a central basic passage that I want us to read, and that's going to be uh, in, uh, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 14, beginning in verse 35, and I'll read to the end of that section, which I believe is 40, 42, and it's just, it's, just the, it's just Mark's version of Jesus in the, uh, in the garden and what happens as a result of his arrest. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, you, uh, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. And he came and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time, and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to once again open your word, to be able to see and understand and grasp, discern the truth that you have for us. The only way we can understand anything that is in your word is if we belong to you, if your spirit is dwelling within 
us, to be able to give us the ability to see these things that you have for us. And so I pray that you would ignite the power of your Holy Spirit in every single person in this room. And every single person that will be hearing this, no matter what the venue or circumstances. And that for those of us who are your followers, those of us who have been saved, redeemed, born again by you, we would know and see the truth of who you are and who we are in you. And for those who may be here today who have no idea who you really are, that today would be the day you would open their hearts and minds and you remove the blinders of the minds of those who have been blinded by the enemy in order to be, see the truth of who you really are. You have given us these 66 books, Lord. We don't have to wonder about you. We don't have to suppose about you. We don't have to guess about you. It's all there. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. May you be lifted up and glorified so that people would be drawn unto you. It's in the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through these names. And then I'm going to ask you if you know who this particular person is. And then we'll go from there, all right? And then we'll talk about why Jesus reacted to that particular person in that particular way. And so let's go chronologically. That's what I did. The first person on our list is a guy named Malchus. Does anybody know who Malchus is? Malchus probably would have had a really hard time wearing glasses if it hadn't been for Jesus. Does that give you any hint at all? Malchus is the guy who Peter, actually Malchus is the guy who Peter cut off his ear in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was being arrested. Peter, of course, known as a, a little bit of a hothead, decides to grab his sword. He's going to take matters into his own hands. Now, here's what I am crystal clear about. I am crystal clear that, that, uh, that Peter was not Zorro. So Peter was not aiming for Malchus's ear. I think we could probably, look, can, imagine, can, I don't know how many sword wielders we have out there with us right now, but I got to believe it would be pretty hard to cut some, intentionally cut somebody's ear off with a sword. That's not what Peter was doing. What was Peter doing? Trying to behead him or hit him in the head with the sword. Malchus was a servant to the high priest Caiaphas. He happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, which when you're a servant, which by the way, that word in the original language can also be translated as slave. So we have no idea whether he was a voluntary servant of, of Caiaphas or we don't know if he was forced into that. Here's what we do know. They surely must have pushed him up front, <laughs> right? I mean, that guy was up. He's the one that got Peter's sword. So my guess is it was like, you know, these, there's 12 of those guys. They could be causing some problems. Let's say, uh, Malchus, you go ahead and... And you go up front. Well, let's look at, he's barely mentioned in the scriptures, but let's look at the passages that refer to Malchus. And we're going to see John chapter 18. We're going to be jumping around a lot. So if you don't want to, uh, you can write these down and, uh, and go back and look at them later. It's like the old sword drills, right? But we're going to be zipping back and forth here. John chapter 18, dating myself with that term, yeah. John chapter 18, verses 10 and 11. And Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? We also have another version of this in Luke chapter 22. One of the reasons, again, why all of these Gospels need to be read together. We don't read one account. These are four different perspectives on the same event, so we have to read them all. Luke chapter 22, verses 50 and 51, and one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear, but Jesus said no more of this, and he touched his ear, and he healed him. So here's a guy that was coming to help in the arrest of Jesus, got injured, Jesus actually healed him. What he didn't do was say, Ha! You got what you deserve. You shouldn't have been here in the first place. It's interesting, isn't it? It's one of the reasons why we have this story. What is it about this story with Malchus that God's trying to tell us? 
about Jesus' mission when he was on this planet. Well, one of it is this. That Jesus came to heal the hurting, whether we deserve it or not. This is extremely important for us to understand. If we miss this, we're going to miss a lot. If there's one thing that unifies every single human being on this planet, and there's probably more than one, but if there's one thing that unifies every single human being on this planet, it's this. We all know pain and suffering. We all know it. We know what it means to hurt, not just physical pain like Malchus. This is not, let's not relegate it only to that. We're talking about pain and suffering in general. Pain and suffering is the great equalizer in humanity, is it not? It doesn't matter how much money you have or how much money you don't have. It doesn't matter how much power you have or how much power you don't have, how much education you have or a lack of education. It doesn't matter. Pain is a universal attacker. And Jesus reached out and healed a guy's pain who had come to do him harm. And let's not forget who Malchus was, or at least his position. What was he? He was a servant slash slave to the high priest, Caiaphas, who ironically is the next person we're going to be talking about here. But in a more general sense, Malchus was enslaved to the wrong master. When we think about it like that, we have a lot more in common with Malchus than we might actually think, right? Before we come to faith in Christ, outside of faith in Christ, what is our nature according to Romans 6.6? 6? What is our nature? We are slaves. We are enslaved to sin, which means we cannot help but to do what sin tells us to do. That's what slaves do. They are told to do what their master tells them to do. In our case, our master is sin. That's the word you hear over and over and over again. You're a slave to sin. In fact, we talked about this a little bit last week, so we won't belabor this, but the reality is there are only two types of people on this entire planet. People who are slaves to sin and people who are slaves to righteousness, and that's it. Saved and unsaved, redeemed, unredeemed. That's it. As far as the Scripture's concerned, as far as God's concerned, that's all that matters. And just as Malchus was enslaved to the wrong master, and Jesus healed him anyway, such is the case with me. I was saved when I was 20 years old. For the first 20 years of my life, I was enslaved to the wrong master. And Jesus healed me. He just healed me of all my physical issues. He doesn't do that. There's no promise he's going to heal us from all of that. But what he does is he wraps his healing in peace. And he gives us the peace to be able to sustain all of these things. That's why it's called the peace that surpasses all understanding. We get peace and we don't have any idea why I should feel peace in this circumstances. I should feel the exact opposite of that. And it was a picture here with what he did with Malchus when he reached out to a guy who was a slave to the wrong master, a slave to a master that hated Jesus. And Jesus healed him anyway because that's what he does. That was part of his mission. And it's amazing to me that it starts out that the first person Jesus interaction, interacts with in his passion narrative as we get to this point where he's being arrested is a guy who does not deserve his healing in any way, shape, or form, but gets it anyway. And guess who that is? That is all of us. That's why this story's in here. So we will understand that. We are no different from Malchus. We're no different, by the way, from any of these people that we're going to look at, despite some of the terrible things that they said. And they did. We're no different from them. Not in our nature. In our actions, maybe, but not in our nature. And that's the entire point that we have to understand. Okay, quickly, let's move on to number two. The second person on our list is Caiaphas. And who was Caiaphas? Caiaphas was the high priest. He was the person of power. Judaism at that time was not simply just a religion it was also, I mean, it, was, it, was, it, it ruled every part 
of their lives. So they had their version of a Congress, for lack of a better word, the Sanhedrin. Drew a group of people that were kind of a ruling, and then of those people, then they had the high priest, who I guess is kind of like the president. You got the Congress, you got the president, really more like a ruler, because I'm not sure how much there was actually a lot of democracy going on there. But Caiaphas was the high priest. He was the one that was supposed to be able to determine whether or not Jesus had blasphemed and was worthy of death. Here's the interesting thing about it. He didn't have the power to put Jesus to death. The Romans had taken that power away from the Jews when they came in and conquered them. The only way anybody could be sentenced to death was by Roman justice. Now, without that, they could have easily done that. That's what they wanted to do. But, but Caiaphas had his hands tied a little bit, and as a result, he had to actually go through a trial to be able to show that this was the case. So even though we have several versions of Jesus' interaction with Caiaphas, let's look at the one in Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 52. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 52. Uh, I'm sorry, 57. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. So the fix is in here, right? That's what the scripture is clearly insinuating. But they found none, they, though many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have heard, now heard his testimony. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. And they spit in his face and struck him and some slapped him saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? So why is this interaction with Caiaphas placed in the passion narrative? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but ultimately for our understanding today, it shows us that Jesus came to proclaim the truth to a hostile world. And we have to understand that if there's one thing that I think the vast majority of believers today have no idea, not the depths, not the understanding, not the level that we should understand this is how hostile the world is in which we live. Now, I'm not talking about certain cities that have certain crime rates or certain states that have this. That is not what I'm talking about at all. That's not what the Scripture is talking about. The Scripture is talking about what Jesus said to them in John chapter 15. The world hates me. And so the world, he means the non-believing world, and so the world will hate you simply because you belong to me, simply because you believe me. We live in an extremely hostile world. We have for the last 2,000 years, for the life of me, why we have evangelical churches today who seem like they really want to get along with the world is absolutely beyond me. I have no idea where that comes from because it ain't coming from that book. We, I'm not saying we should separate ourselves from them. We talked a little bit about that last week. That's not what God is saying. That's certainly not what I'm saying. But we have to understand the hostility that the world has for us for one reason and one reason only, that because of who Jesus is and who he claimed to be. In John chapter 5, you want to see the genesis of all of this? In John chapter 5, verse six, verses 16 through 18. It reads, and this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, not only because he was breaking the Sabbath, but he was, calling, he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. That's why they hate him then. That's why the world hates him now. Because he is God. 
in the flesh. If we miss that, we will miss everything related to salvation. We live in a hostile world. Our adversary, you know, that's why it, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because, as I said last week, we are completely lying to ourselves. <laughs> we are completely lying to ourselves as we see this so-called cancel culture continue to grow. Do you really honestly think that their ultimate goal is to get comedians off TV and actors fired off of shows and all these? Do you really think that's what all of this is about? We know what this is all about, right? We know ultimately what this is all going to be about. If those things are offensive, wait till they get to God's Word. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, is what Jesus said. One of the single most divisive statements ever uttered. The exclusivity of Jesus, it drives the world insane. There are, by the way, are they going to be successful in canceling Jesus? North Korea hasn't canceled Jesus. We're not going to do it. That's not the point. The point is understanding the hostility in the world in which we live. They hate Jesus. They hate him. Even if they say they don't, they do. Why? Because the scripture says they do. They do. You see what we're getting at here? We have to grasp onto that and understand that. And if we stopped speaking the truth because we live in a world of hostility, then we will stop speaking truth at all. That's the point. Look, if our adversary, if our adversary could get everybody but to believe on the planet, could get everybody to believe that Jesus was a good man, a good teacher, and a good role model, he'd be completely happy with that. He would. Our adversary's goal is not necessarily to stamp out Jesus in this world. It's to have people believing in the, in the wrong Jesus. That's the whole point. Jesus spoke the truth in a hostile world. Man, I, I really wish I could tell you this, guys, that the world's going to get better for us, but it's not. It's just not. <laughs> and Jesus did that even though he knew that speaking the truth to the hostile world that he was dealing with at the time was going to lead to his death. That didn't stop him at all. As a matter of fact, let's look at it strictly from... How many of you trial movie or TV shows watch? I, I don't watch TV shows, but I love movies about trials, right? So you know how, the, you know how the, the, it's the same old trope, right? You know, things are going well for the prosecution, and then they go well for the defense, and then they kind of go back and forth. Let me ask you something. Based on the passage we just read, how's the trial going for Caiaphas at this point? Is it, you think it's going good? I don't think it's going good at all. <laughs> Caiaphas, I don't think, thought it was going very good. He had to have at least, at least two witnesses that agreed in order to be able to send us to somebody to death. And even the one they thought they had that was going to say the same thing didn't say the same thing. He said he could destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well, I heard him say two days. It was not, look, I don't know if they had a Fifth Amendment back then, but Jesus was in pretty good shape here, right? Just keep your trap shut. Don't say anything. From a legal standpoint, they got nothing on you. And yet, when asked by the high priest, Caiaphas, to do his job for him, Jesus did it. Yeah, absolutely. I am exactly who you say that I am. And you're going to see me sitting at the right hand of the Father, guaranteeing that he would be crucified. Now that is speaking truth to a hostile crowd. And that's what he did. And that's what we're going to have to do. It's one of the reasons why this interaction is even in there in the first place. Go back and read it. Yeah, Jesus got condemned, but he got condemned because of what he said. The trial was not going well for anybody else, especially for Caiaphas. And Jesus let him off the hook and basically confessed because that's what he came here to do. And that's what he has done on our behalf as well. Number three, and this one is one of my favorites. It is one of the most... There are, there are so many lessons that can be drawn from this one. And, and, I, and I think it's because this is, uh, I, 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 there are so many words we could use for Jesus, and they all fall short, right? 
He was smart. Yeah, Jesus was smart. That wall, brilliant. Yeah, even that word falls. Jesus was actually very cool, too, right? Jesus was a cool guy, and this is one of those moments where you see that level of coolness. It's one of the least talked about aspects of his, of his passion narrative, and it is absolutely one of my favorites because when Pilate, which we'll talk about him in just a minute, Pilate sends him to a guy named Herod Antipas. Do you, does anybody in here know who Herod Antipas is? Most, yeah, he was, he was the guy who, who had John the Baptist executed. But do you know who he is? He was a, what the scripture refers to as a tetrarch, which means he was a ruler. His father was King Herod the Great, right? The same Herod that killed all the children two years and under when Jesus was born. So Herod dies, and then Rome divides up. He was a, a, a king. He was a puppet king. He was put in there by the, by the Romans. But when he died, instead of putting another king in his place, they divided up his kingdom into these four areas and had a ruler placed over each one of them. And Galilee was under the, the auspices of a guy named Herod Antipas. Now, Herod Antipas, uh, along with killing John the Baptist, there was a lot of incest in his family. He was a really, really bad guy. So if you remember, well, you know what? Let's not remember. Let's read the passage. In Luke chapter 23, we see Jesus, and Luke is the only one that records this, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong about that, so don't hold me to it, but I think he's the only one that records this. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad. For he had longed to desire to see him because he had heard about him and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, sent him back to Pilate. Which I can't believe Pilate would have actually liked, but it says here in the next verse, And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other of that very day. Before that, they had been at enmity with each other. But, but Pilate was trying to pass the buck here. So he sent Jesus to a guy who really didn't have any power, really, at all. He, only had, he did what Rome told him to do. In fact, we know the emperor Caligula later on actually exiled Herod Antipas to Spain because he was such an ineffectual ruler. Let me ask you this. Based on what we've just read, and based on the other things we know about Jesus' passion narrative, what role did Herod Antipas play in Jesus being crucified and, and, and his resurrection? What role did he play? It's not a trick question, but it is a very easy question. Nothing. He was not a part of it. He couldn't have let Jesus go. He couldn't have executed him. He couldn't have told him to be executed. I don't know why Pilate sent him one in the first place, except maybe he was just trying to buy some time, maybe to get the, 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 uh, the Sanhedrin to calm down about Jesus. Herod Antipas played no role in God's plans at all for Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And because of that, what did Jesus say to him while he was standing in front of him and everybody else was mocking him? Exactly. Exactly. Part of the reason that Jesus came was to ignore the mockers. He ignored the mockers. Paul caught up on this, right? Remember when he's in front of Agrippa? And he's given his impassioned plea and he's talking about how God had saved him and he's, he's talking to King Agrippa about the gospel and all of these other things. And Festus, the, the procurator that brought him there in the first place, said basically what to Paul? Do you remember that? Paul, you're crazy. You remember what Paul said? I'm not crazy. King Agrippa, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> what did he do to Festus? You don't play any role in this. I'm not even going to talk to you about this. This, to me, is one of the coolest aspects of Jesus' interaction with all of these folks. He was placed in front of somebody who played no role other than to mock him. That was the only thing they were doing was mocking. And Jesus didn't defend himself. He didn't tell him who he was. He didn't give a defense in any way, shape, or form. He completely, 100% ignored him. My goodness, could we all take just a little bit of that understanding when we're dealing with the world. Social media has made that extremely difficult. It's hard, is it not? When you see a post 
by someone or an answer to a post by someone having to do with Christianity and they've got it all wrong. They're completely misrepresenting. All they're trying to do is mock Christianity, mock Christians, mock Christ, mock God. It is extremely hard not to jump in there and start talking away. But you know what? That person has no part of God in my life in any way, shape, or form. And so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to treat them like Herod Antipas. And I'm going to ignore them. Now, there are people God puts in our way, right? He puts some people in our, in our path so that we do in, in, engage them with the gospel. I'm not talking about ignoring everybody. Jesus didn't ignore everybody. In fact, this is the only one he did ignore. He made the distinction between who he was going to listen to and who he was going to engage in and who he didn't. He certainly wasn't going to waste his time with Herod Antipas. And that's an extremely important thing for us to be able to understand as believers. We don't have to engage everybody. I'll tell you up front, I do not argue with people about the gospel. I'll tell them up front, you want to argue with me about it? Man, my time is worth way more than that. You want to have a conversation about it? I'm all over that. Even at the end of it, if they come in and say, that's still a bunch of junk, I don't believe any of it. Okay, as long as we're having some sort of conversation. But if all you're going to do is mock, my goodness, all I have to do is turn the TV on to see that. We're mocked at every single turn. Jesus came in part to ignore the mockers so that we would, in turn, ignore the mockers. They play no role in our lives at all. All they want to do is mock, and that's a great example. That's why that's always been one of my favorite interactions with Jesus uh, with, with, during his, his, uh, his passion narrative and one of the ones that we talk about the least. But it is extraordinary, his interaction with him. Number four, we'll get close to here to wrapping up here. Of course, the one we're probably most familiar with is... Pontius Pilate. Pilate spent a great deal of time talking with Jesus. We have some of the most amazing conversations, I think, in all of Scripture related to Jesus' interaction with Pilate. The version that uh, I want to take a look at here today, there are several of them, but this one's in John chapter 19 and verses 8 through 12. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him then. You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. The entire key aspect to this. Why, why is this in here? Because part of Jesus' mission was to not only, as I said earlier, speak the truth to a hostile world, it was also to speak the truth to power, to powerful people. Pilate was convinced that he was the one who was in charge of all of this. He gets frustrated when Jesus doesn't talk to him, and then he says this, Don't you know I have the power to crucify you or to set you free? Jesus' response is extraordinary, is it not? First of all, does he say you don't have that power? No, he doesn't say that. Jesus acknowledges it. He just puts it in the proper perspective, right? Sure, yeah, you, you have the power to do this. You, would, you wouldn't have this power unless it had been given to you from above. Jesus, standing in front of the man who could, by his own admission, with one strike of his pen, send him to the cross or send him home. And Jesus basically says to him, you think you're in charge of this? You, you think you're in control of this? This is probably was kind of a bit insulting to Pilate, I would think, to a certain extent. You know what he was saying to Pilate? You're just a cog in the wheel. You're just a part of the machinery. God's the one that's doing all of this. You're a pawn on a board, and you're being moved into this spot at this time to do what the Father wants you to do. We're going to be in positions like this, not probably as dire as what Jesus was in. 
We see this back, by the way, in, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right? You remember those guys? Wouldn't bow down and worship Nebuchadnezzar's image at the sound of the music? So what did he do? He got them together and he said, you guys are going to do this? I'm going to throw you in this furnace. Your choice. The most powerful man in the world at that time, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did what? They looked at him and said, our God is able to save us from this. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to you. It's amazing, isn't it? Jesus told us that the only thing we had to be afraid of, the only thing, we as believers, not all people, as believers, if you're here today, if you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior, the only thing that we have to be afraid of is someone who can hurt the soul. That's what he says. Don't fear anybody that can hurt the body. Only fear someone that can hurt your soul. As a believer, how many people can hurt my soul? It's not a trick question. Nobody. Nobody can hurt my soul. My soul belongs to him. That's the point of the statement in the first place. So in essence, this is Jesus' way of saying, if you belong to me, who do you have to be afraid of? And the answer is, nobody. He wants us to live like that. He wants us to be able to enjoy our lives. And one of the fringe benefits of being a believer is not being afraid of anybody. Does that mean there aren't people out there who can hurt us? Of course it doesn't mean that. Of course there are people out there that can hurt us, physically hurt us, kill us even. But when, if that were to happen to me, they might think they're doing something you know, pretty terrible to me. And then when I come to, awaken, whatever the case may be, I walk in streets of gold. That's the whole point, is to be able to speak the truth regardless of the power of the people that we're talking to. We are not really experiencing that much persecution in this country. I believe if we all live long enough, we're going to see that happen. I think we'll, I, we're not going to be immune to that. The rest of the world hasn't been immune. We're certainly not going to be immune to it. So he shows us that he came in part to confront the powerful. Next, and we're going to finish up here very quickly. I know we're running a little bit over, but let me, let me finish these two and then we'll be done. Simon, Simon of Cyrene, Mark chapter 15. Anybody know who that is, by the way? Who's Simon? Simon was the guy who got selected to carry Jesus' cross on the way to his crucifixion. In Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 21, and they compelled, it's an extremely important word here, we'll get to that in a second, and they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander, Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross, and they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. Again, I think this is the only indication that, that we have of, uh, of that. There may be one other passage referencing it, but this is the most detailed passage that we have, that we have the guy's name, and we, oddly enough, have the name of his kid. Isn't that interesting? I don't know any of the name of the kids of the 12 disciples, if they had them, but we know this guy's kids. This is interesting. I think we'll get to that in just a second. The word that's used there in the original language, that he was compelled to carry Jesus' cross, it means he was forced to do it. He didn't want any part of this. Cyrene is, was in uh, what's modern-day Libya. So obviously he was in Jerusalem for what? He was there for the Passover, like a lot of other displaced Jews were. So he's there from the Passover. He's not from Israel. He's not from Jerusalem. He came all the way from what's modern-day Libya now in order to come there. We have no indication that he had any sympathy for Jesus in any way, shape, or form. He knows that, that he has been condemned by the Romans, which may not have been enough to convince him, but he also knows that Jesus was condemned by the Sanhedrin. He was condemned by his own, Simon's own religious leaders. So you've got to figure there's something there going on that he, he realized that Jesus is probably not a good guy. The word compelled there in the original language is actually a Persian word. It was, borrowed, it was brought over from Persian into Koine Greek, and it was the idea meaning that when you were sent by the king to do something and you had a letter to be able to get, uh, had a mission to complete, that you could take anybody or anything that you felt was necessary in order to move that mission 
forward. So he was forced to do it. He didn't want any part of that. And what does that show us? That Jesus came in part to do what? To reach out to the skeptical. Simon was certainly skeptical. He didn't want any part of this. He didn't know what to think about Jesus. He didn't know what to believe about Jesus. He didn't know if Jesus was a good guy or a bad guy. Just like us. I was saved when I was 20 years old. Do you think that was the first time I'd ever heard Jesus' name? Jesus' name plenty. We weren't a church-going family, but I, you know, I saw movies and I heard people talk about it. I've been in church a few times before then. I knew Jesus' name, but I didn't know him. And I didn't know what to think about him. You know what I thought initially? I thought maybe. And I wasn't an overly bad guy. I mean, you know, we all, we all have our stories, right? When we especially don't ever tell our kids. I wasn't an overly bad guy, but you know what I thought Jesus was going to be? I thought he was going to be somebody that was going to make me a better person. That's, that's what I thought. I thought he was a really good role model. I thought he was a really good teacher. And I thought maybe he would fix whatever, uh, whatever behavior problems that I had. I'm doing this. I don't want to do this anymore. Jesus is the answer to that. He's like the ultimate self-help guru, right? I just reach out to this guy and kind of read what he says or listen to what I think of who he might be. And I couldn't have been more wrong than I tried. If I tried, I couldn't have been more wrong because Jesus is not interesting and interested in changing our behavior. He is interested in transforming us. He doesn't want to make me a better version of me. He wants to make me a new me. The person I was before I became a believer, I'm not messing around here according to Scripture, literally does not exist anymore. He hasn't existed on this planet for a very, very, very long time. A new creation is what Corinthians tells us. If any person be in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. All things are become new. I was a skeptic just like Simon was a skeptic. And he reached out to me just like he reached out to Simon. Whatever happened to Simon, by the way? Do we have any idea? You know, if you go to the end of Romans and he starts listing a group of names, guess whose name pops up there? It's not Simon's. It's his son's name pops up on there. It's a really good chance that they became believers because there's a very good chance that Simon became a believer. Our Roman Catholic buddies actually said that's the case. He became the first, I think, Archbishop of Avignon. I'm not sure how they, how they know all of this. Excuse me, know all of this. But that's the legacy of God reaching out to the skeptical. And that's every single one of us before we come to faith in Him. And lastly, and we'll wrap up with this, the last person is not a person, it's a group of people. And it's the soldiers. They put them on the cross. The soldiers who brutalized Him, who beat Him to within an inch of his life, who used tools so barbaric that we know from extra-biblical texts most people didn't survive the scourging they gave to Jesus. They had whips with these hooks on them, and they were designed for one thing and one thing only, that when the hooks left in the flesh and they pulled it, they said, we know from extra-biblical texts that some people were so good at this, and the Romans were good at inflicting pain. They were so good at it, they could expose internal organs. They took these thorns and they shoved them into his head and they dressed him up. They kneeled down in front of him. They mocked him. They taunted him. And they humiliated him. And at one point during all of this, Jesus says something about them. And here's what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, Father, get them. Make them pay. You see what they're doing to me? You make sure they get what's coming to them. He didn't say any of that. What did he say? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Why is that in there? Because it shows that Jesus came 
to forgive the unforgivable. To forgive the unforgivable. He was praying for the people who were brutalizing him. The same one that would mock him. The same ones that would gamble over his clothes and happily nail nails into his hands and to his feet. And he prayed for them. The same nature. Please don't, don't mishear me in this. I'm not saying the same actions. The same nature that led them to do what they did is the same nature that is in every single human being born on this planet. It doesn't mean we're all going to do the same bad things, but the same nature that drove them that. The rea- Look, raise your hand in here if you've never sinned. Okay, cool. That, my hand wasn't up, by the way. I was modeling that for you in case you wanted to put your hand up. Of course, that's not, we, we all know that that's not, that's not even feasible. We'll, we, we're going to be do good if we get through the day without saying, doing, or thinking something that's the opposite of what God wants us to do. That's just the reality. Why? Because that is our nature. And that sin put him on the cross. He does not go on the cross if I don't sin. If I were the only person on the planet who sinned, he still would go to the cross to pay for that sin. Jesus came. The whole idea of the gospel is to forgive the unforgivable. That's us. The open disobedience that we have when we do the opposite of what God wants us to. He still died and rose again for us to pay that debt that we could never pay. If we had a thousand lifetimes, we'd never be able to pay it. It's extraordinary, isn't it? These interactions with these folks are not just put in there. They're not just given to us for the sake of us understanding. It's it's trying to grasp on to what Jesus actually did while he was on this planet. And so much of it is confined to these verses here and these interactions with these people. So what did he do when he was talking to these people? Here's what he communicated us as he was talking to these people. That he came here to heal the hurting. That he came here to to proclaim the truth to a hostile world. That he came to ignore the mockers, that he came to confront the powerful, that he came to reach out to the doubtful, and he came to forgive the unforgivable. And we see the culmination of that next week when we celebrate the resurrection. The gospel. What is the gospel? You would think that would be a really simple answer. And yet we struggle with it so often. Let me start out with what the gospel is not. The gospel is not simply going to church. Are there unsaved people who go to church? Will there always be unsaved people that go to church? Then going to church is not the gospel. It's not reading the Bible. Even though reading the Bible is a good thing. Going to church is a good thing. Reading the Bible is a necessary thing. Are there unbelievers who read the Bible? Yes, I know plenty of them who do. That's not the gospel. It contains the gospel, but it's not the gospel. It's not believing in God, which is absolutely necessary for us to be a believer. But James tells us the demons believe that there's a God. So believing in God or that God exists is not the gospel. And it's not doing good things, even though we're supposed to do all of these things. Yes, we need to go to church. We need to read the Bible. Obviously need to believe in God. Obviously obviously need to do good things. Here's the reality. Those are the results of the gospel. They're not the gospel in and of itself. What is the gospel? The gospel is that we have to recognize that we are sinners. I know that's not a popular word. I know a lot of people don't want to hear that. There are a lot of things I don't want to hear either. But the reality is that if we don't get this and recognize that we are sinners, that our nature is to do the opposite of what God wants us to do, in open rebellion to God, it doesn't make us horrible, evil people. It just makes us in need of a Savior. We have to recognize that we're sinners. We have to know that that sin separates us from God. We can have no relationship with Him as long as that sin exists. We have to realize that we owe a debt for that sin whether we think we do or not. It doesn't matter. We owe the debt to the sin. That debt is death. For the rages of sin is death. That's the payment. Except that this makes us an enemy of God. Again, even if we don't feel like it, God tells us that that is the case. We have to understand if if all I think Look, if as a person, if all I believe is that I've got a few behavior issues and if I get these behavior issues fixed, I'm good, I'm great, I'm ready to go. Then what was the cross for? 
What was the resurrection for? Jesus wasted a lot of time and a lot of pain and suffering when all he could have done is say, here's a list of things, go through those and you're good to go. This makes us an enemy of God. We have to understand that Jesus paid that debt on the cross and ultimately confess and believe the gospel. A gazillion books have been written about the gospel over the last 2,000 years, and yet it is so simple that even a child can understand it. How extraordinary is that? I hope you now see that these interactions, these things that Jesus said and did, who he talked to, and all of these other cool things that he did, they aren't just in there to be cool things. They're in there to communicate something extremely important for us to be able to understand that we're never going to understand, by the way, apart from him, and that we see exactly what it is that he has done for us exactly how much he loves us. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity that you have given us here this morning, Lord. I thank you for the love and the grace and the mercy. I thank you for these events that have been portrayed in your word so that we are able to see the things that you want us to see and understand the things you want us to understand. And more than anything, Lord, that we would see the grace that you have bestowed upon us. Everything you have done for us is motivated by your love and expressed by the grace that you have shown us. None of us are worthy of your forgiveness. None of us are worthy of your salvation, and yet you give it to us anyway. You make it available to us anyway. You guide us and lead us to it anyway. And I thank you, Lord, that I don't have to be afraid of anything or anybody because I know And not because I know, because it's in my heart. I know because I've read it in your word. You've told me this. I don't have to wonder about it, suppose it. But I know that when I draw my last breath on this planet, when I'm standing in your presence, I will hear, well done. Well done. Even though I will feel like I did anything other than do something well, I will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And it won't be because of anything that I've done, but because of everything that you have done for me and through me. And so as we enter this time, this, this week, as we, as we celebrate this upcoming week as the last week before the crucifixion and resurrection, may these moments that we've talked about here this morning and others in that week stick out in our heart and our mind because all it does is show us more of who you are. I don't want to know about you. Anybody can learn about you, Lord. I want to know you better than I ever have before. Every single day I want to know you better than I did the day before. And only you can do that through the power of your Spirit. And so, Lord, as we leave this place, I pray that we go with the understanding and knowing of who we are in you. And if we don't know you as Lord and Savior, today would be the day that, God, that you would reach into the hearts of those who desperately need to be transformed by your grace and your mercy and your salvation, that you would be lifted up and glorified in their lives. For it's in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen.